Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 15, I'll be reading verses 22 through 27. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. God's word for his people. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. missionary moment for today comes to us from the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. And today is school day. Today let us pray for the following. The Bible College of East Africa in Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Bethel Bible and Technical School in Kenya. The kindergarten programs in Kenya. The seminaries in kindergarten in Brazil. The kindergarten in Cambodia. Zion Middle School in Guatemala. And please remember the administrators and teachers as well as the students. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the outreach of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. We thank you for their diligence in teaching the Word of God and beginning at the very earliest levels with kindergartens in each of the countries where they serve. We thank you, Father, for the young people in these schools, the littlest ones all the way up through the seminaries who are learning the word of God, that they might serve you faithfully. Father, we certainly pray for all those in those schools, especially among the younger ones, who have not yet trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We pray that you will convict them by your Holy Spirit, that even at a young age they are sinners. They are lost, they are headed for hell, and without Jesus Christ they have no hope of salvation. We pray, Father, that they might understand the word of God, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that they might believe on him whom alone to know is eternal life, that you would give them the gift of eternal life, and that they would rejoice and grow in their faith as they have an intake day by day of the word of God, as they are mentored and taught and trained 
by older, more mature Christians that you might give them a godly vision for the future of serving you, that you might give them the opportunities for training, that you might give to them the financial resources necessary for furthering their education, that you would provide for each of them a godly life partner so that they might be able to serve you as a family. Father, we pray for many of these whom we don't even know, but you know them. You know these schools. You know the faithfulness of the teachers and the administrators. You know how many of them are serving on the foreign field without full support, and yet they're serving because you have called them there. Father, we pray for your blessing upon them this day. We pray that you'll fill their hearts with joy and with gladness. We pray that you'll help them to overcome any obstacles that are placed in the way of their educational training by the government or by perhaps pagan forces or Muslim forces or Hindu forces or other radicals who are seeking to annihilate the gospel. We pray that you place a hedge of protection around them and around their families. Father, we pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified in the way they live as well as in the words that they speak. Father, we pray for those of us here, too, who are seeking to serve you. We pray that you might cause us each to have a focus on things eternal and not on things temporal, that our hearts and our minds and our lives would be centered around Jesus Christ and his proclamation to all those who have not heard, to those who are lost and who perhaps have heard many times. We think especially of our loved ones, our relatives. Many of them have heard multiple times about Christ and have rejected the gospel. Father, we pray that you would irresistibly draw them by the spirit of grace, that you would cause them to have an intense yearning and desire for Christ as he woos them by the spirit of God. We pray, Father, for our country and for those in authority over us, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty. We pray for the salvation of all of our leaders in the administrative branch of government, the executive branch of government, the we pray, Father, for your mercy upon our Supreme Court. We pray, Father, for our Congress, for our House of Representatives, for our Governor, Lieutenant Governor, for our State House. Father, we pray for the judiciary here in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. And Father, we pray that you might cause your will to be done so that as different laws are passed, as they are executed, as they are upheld by the courts, that they might bring the greatest good for your people and the greatest glory for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you have in your mercy called us here today. We pray that you will quiet our hearts, that you will cause us to focus on the word of God, that the distractions of the past week and the coming week would be completely obliterated from our minds, that you'd help us to see Christ and him crucified, risen and coming again, that we might understand what is your word for us, your people, so that we might be more obedient so that we might be warned by the sins of Israel, the things into which they fell, and you've given us those warnings so that we would not fall into the same kind of sins that they did. Father, we pray that you'd fill our hearts with joy and gladness, especially at the freedom that we have to worship you here in this place. And Father, we pray for now your blessings upon the remainder of this service, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers are coming forward this morning to receive our morning gifts and offerings, we're once again reminded of the great truth of the gospel, that salvation is the free gift of God. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says. That's not my words. I'm not quoting some kind of a prayer book. I'm <coughs> quoting scripture. You're not saved by your own works. You cannot get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. That's why he had to die. He died for you. He paid in full for your sins. Yes, he was dead. He didn't swoon. He was buried in a tomb behind a massive boulder. But on the third day, the power of God blasted it out of the way, and he came forth. Oh, he could have come forth without the blasting away of that stone. But it was rolled out of the way so that we could go and see he is risen. 
Have you trusted him? Have you trusted him alone for your salvation? For their salvation and no other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name but Jesus. If you've never trusted him, do it today. Gracious Father, thank you for the privilege that we have of worshiping you through giving. This is an act of worship. This is not merely a tax-deductible donation. We worship you. We give to you because you first gave to us. We would have nothing if it were not for your inestimable gift, your eternal gift, your omnipotent gift of life through Christ. And Father, now we thank you by our giving. In Jesus' name, amen. standing and take your hymnals and turn to number 572 572 blessed assurance Jesus is mine 572 Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a forest of glory we find! Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my star, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, my person, my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at trust. I am my Savior, happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story, 
praises my soul, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me now, if you will, to that passage that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15. We're looking once again at verses 22 through 27. Bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert, part 20. And what we're looking at, as you know, we've uh, looked at the ten times the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. We've gotten basically through the first two with an introduction onto the third one, but we had interrupted that series with a uh, four weeks on fear is the opposite of faith, uh, because when they rebelled against God, they were manifesting fear. And so we talked about the significance of what happens when we walk by fear instead of walking by faith. So let me finish a summary of the principles that we learned in the Old Testament, just very quickly. Number one, things that we learned from their Old Testament studies on fear versus faith. Number one, fear is a tool that the devil always uses to get you to rebel against God. Fear is a tool the devil almost always uses to get you to rebel against God. Number two, fear has bad consequences and faith has good consequences. Now these seem to be no-brainers, but most of the time we don't think about it. We get into a panic mode and all of a sudden we forget that we're going to have bad consequences because of fear. Number three, there's an important contrast between the fear of man, which in the Bible is always bad, and the fear of the Lord, which in the Bible is always good. There are two kinds of fear. One of them goes downhill, one of them goes uphill. The fear of man brings the snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That's what the Word of God says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's the good one. So you see a contrast. When you see that word fear, don't just automatically think bad because it's the fear of man, the fear of circumstances, the fear of things that are happening in the world around you versus the fear of the Lord, which means you're trusting him to control all the bad things of life. Number four, God commands us. He doesn't suggest. He doesn't request. He commands us not to be afraid of people and circumstances of life because he's with us. That was the fourth principle that we learned. And we noted at that point that fear not occurs in that context 62 times in the Bible. Number five, fifth summary, the Bible gives specific reasons not to be afraid. The commands not to be afraid are not irrational self-courage. A lot of people say, well, the Bible says don't be afraid. I'm trying not to. No, no, no. It's not irrational self-courage. The commands are linked to the personal promises of the omnipotent God who made the universe. And either he's lying to us or he's telling us the truth. And he commanded it. So if you refuse to believe him, and if you refuse to act on his promises, what you're doing is calling God a liar. Then we move to the New Testament studies last week. The New Testament is even more specific and direct. It reaffirms the Old Testament reasons not to fear, and it reaffirms the specific blessings for being filled with faith. But, as we saw last week, the New Testament also gives at least 12 additional reasons for living by faith and not living in fear. I'm not going to read all those verses, but I'm going to list all 12 of them for you. I hope you got them last week because I'm going to go quick on this. Number one, personal relationships that God has ordained are holy. That's why you don't have to be afraid. Remember that was the Mary-Joseph situation and Joseph was uh, afraid and Mary was afraid. But personal relationships that God has ordained are holy. You don't have to be afraid. Number two, the fear of God should always supersede the fear of man. Now, we've talked about the fear of the Lord and the fear of man, but in the New Testament, we, say, we see specifically that it is to supersede the fear of man. Number three, we saw that there is no fear to those who seek Christ. Remember the women at the tomb? Well, the angels say to them, fear not. I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. There is no fear to them who seek Christ. Christ. Number four, there is no fear to those who come to God in holy prayer for righteous requests. Now, if you're coming, you know, 
to, for carnal requests, James says, uh, you, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You know, if you ask amiss, you are not going to get a prayer request. It's not a holy prayer. For example, you say, God, I just saw that TV preacher. He just bought himself a $17 million jet so he can fly around the world and not have to sit on an airline with those other people because after all, he's an evangelist. He doesn't want to talk to other people. Wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, I would like a gold-plated Cadillac. Now, if you pray like that, that's a carnal request. That is not a righteous request. But remember, we saw Zacharias. And he's coming, he's offering the incense. He was in the course of a bias. There were multiple courses of priests according to their genealogies who would serve for two weeks in the temple and they would be on rotation every year and if you got to be one of these thousands of priests who was actually doing one of the things in the temple it was an incredible honor and Zacharias had been chosen to come and offer the incense at the altar and the angel appeared to him fear not Zacharias for thy prayer is heard your wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby. He was an old man. She was an old woman. They had no children. She'd never been able to get pregnant. They became the parents of John the Baptist. Oh, there's an important principle there. Just remember it. There is no fear to those who come to God in holy prayer for righteous requests. Number five, there is no fear to those who have found favor with God. The angel stood before Mary. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Dear friends, have you found favor with God? Have you trusted Christ? You found favor with God. There is no fear to those who have found favor with God. Number six, we do not need to fear the prophecies and promises of God. We talked about that when we looked at the book of Revelation. And, you know, there's some scary things coming down the pike. But we don't have to fear the prophecies and promises of God because we're part of the bride of Christ. Christ defends his bride. Number seven, fear is not only the opposite of faith, but it also prevents the fulfillment of prayer. When you've got fear, you are going to get no answers to your prayers. You have to pray in faith. It's a prayer of faith. The prayer of faith that God blesses. Number uh, eight. Fear means you don't understand your infinite importance to God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Fear means you don't understand your infinite importance to God. Number nine, fear means you don't understand the guarantee of God's incredible gifts. God has given to us all things in Christ. Is he gonna, if he's given us Jesus, is he going to withhold from us anything else or will he freely give us all things? The Bible says, freely give us all things. Number ten, fear means you don't understand the precise nature of the love and prophecies of God for Israel. God has some incredible prophecies yet for national Israel. The rest of the world screams and yells about it. They, there have been more resolutions in the United Nations against Israel than on any other subject. Did you know that? In the entire history of the United Nations, more resolutions against Israel than on any other subject. The pagans hate Israel because Israel is the promises of God. Satan motivates them to hate Israel. What was the cause behind the Russian pogroms? What was the cause behind the Polish pogroms? What was the cause behind the Nazi Holocaust? What's been behind the uh, Inquisition? What's been behind all of these anti-Jewish movements around the world? The skinheads that we see here in our country. It's the devil that's behind that. Fear means you don't understand the precise nature of the love and prophecies of God for Israel. Number 11, and we saw 
an illustration of this with the Apostle Paul last week. Even great Christian leaders can fear. But God guarantees that nothing can happen to us until it is his time for us to come home to heaven. You know, uh, back in the days of uh, the Reformation, the uh, Pope made a comment to some of his advisors. He says, uh, the one thing that I fear most on the battlefield is a Calvinist because he believes in the sovereignty of God that he can't be killed until it's God's time. <laughs> Dear people, God has appointed the day of our death and you can hide out and crawl under your bed and the day of your death is going to come and you'll die. You'd better be found doing the work of the Lord on the day of your death. We don't have to be afraid of death. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We don't need to fear those that can kill the body. He says, Jesus says, fear him rather that can kill the body and destroy both soul and body in hell. That's God. The day of our death, folks, is coming. I might drop dead while I'm standing here in the pulpit. It's a real possibility. There have been pastors that's happened to. They've been preaching. I know of one elderly couple years ago. Uh, they knelt down by their bed every night and prayed. They prayed together, holding hands. That night, God took them both. They were found kneeling by their bed. And they had both stepped into heaven, holding hands. The day of our death has already been appointed. And so we need to make the best possible use of the time that God has given to us now. You don't have tomorrow. You only have today. Number 12. And perhaps the most significant of those things that we learned from our study last week. Fear means we don't understand who Jesus is. We don't really understand who Jesus is if we're afraid. He loves you. More than mind can imagine. And he is able. Not just willing. What godly man would not die for his wife? And you are part of the bride of Christ. We don't understand who Jesus... That's a serious indictment that shows we don't understand his love for us, even though he is the sovereign judge of the church and the ruler of the universe. Now that brings us back to rebellion test number three. We've finished rebellion test one and two. We've looked at that interlude of fear versus faith. And now we're coming back to rebellion test number three, which is failure to control carnal appetites. Now we've, we've covered most of that, and I'll just review it really quickly for us. But failure to control carnal appetites, or in other words, what we called the seven deadly sins. We began that study shortly before I added that new material about fear that we've just finished. So rebellion test number three was gluttony. That's the third instance of rebellion, and it's at the wilderness of sin. That's in Exodus chapter 16 and verses one through three. That third test, exposed Israel's carnal, selfish, self-serving, and how many of us are self-serving? I mean, as you look at your own life, as I look at my own life, I'm always doing stuff for number one. Instead of thinking about, how can I do everything for Christ? How can I do everything for others? And then do things for myself. You know, there's a little acronym that uh, I saw years and years ago. Do you know how to have real joy, J-O-Y? Put things in this order. J, Jesus. O, others. Y, yourself. <laughs> Put Jesus first, others second, yourself last. J-O-Y. But the flesh wants us to focus on our carnal appetites. And you know, as we began that study of rebellion test number three, 
It revealed how we all yield to the seven deadly sins. This is just an introduction to the seven deadly sins, but it shows you at least four steps. It shows you process. They all begin with P, so it's easy to remember. Four steps, process, principles, procedures, and penalties. Doesn't matter which of the seven deadly sins that you're dealing with, you're going to see those four things. Number one, process, principles, procedure, and penalties. <laughs> we could actually add a fifth because we've had some preceding lessons that are failed or often repeated, which lead to greater failures. If you fail a test and you don't study for it again, you know what? You're going to fail it the second time. Preceding lessons failed are often repeated and they lead to greater failures. When you and I refuse to learn basic lessons, we're guaranteed to fail in our subsequent lessons. Like the, the kindergartner who refuses to learn his ABCs is going to fail when he's trying to learn to read words. If he refuses to learn phonics, he's never going to be able to pronounce big long words. You have to learn the basic lessons or you fail in later lessons. And if you insist, I'm not going to learn my ABCs, I'm not going to learn my ABCs, you'll look at that piece of paper and it looked to you like you pick it up and you say, and here's Arabic. You know, if that was written in Arabic, I couldn't read a word of it. <laughs> not one word. It was written in Hindi, I couldn't read a word of it. It was written in Sanskrit, I couldn't read a word of it. It was written in Hebrew, I might be able to read a few words of it. If it was written in English, you know what, I can read it. Because I really studied English. I learned as a little kid. If you, in any area of life, if you refuse to learn the basic lessons, you're guaranteed to fail in subsequent lessons. Now, Israel failed test number one again here at Rebellion 3. Who remembers what test number one was? Yes, is rebellion against God ordained? The rebellion against God ordained leadership is rebellion against God. So they fail test number one. They fail it again here as we get to number three. Let's read the passage in three verses, Exodus 16. They took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. <laughs> that was test number one, wasn't it? Rebelling against leadership. The second verse is they, they come into the wilderness and they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron. And we've already seen a test related to some water, but now we see a test that's related to food. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. <laughs> Moses probably said, Would to God you had died <laughs> by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. I wish you guys had dropped dead back then. I am tired of the belly aching. Anyway, uh, that was an insert in the text. Not adding it to scripture, just a comment. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Oh my. Have you ever been blamed for something that you didn't do? How many of you have ever been blamed for something you didn't do? All the kids say yes. Uh, and it was your parents, right, that blamed you for something you didn't do? Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that afterwards, right? Mm. Okay. Uh, and the children of Israel said, Would to God we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For you brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, we, we looked at the connected instances, because these, this is connected to the instances of manna and quails, and how God killed many of the adults on the spot at that time. But the focus of the third instance is the sin of gluttony. It's not just their rebellion on the spot he killed them, but now we find gluttony. Now, I hope you remember this because I went over it four weeks ago. Who remembers some of the budaks for learning the seven sins of um, the flesh? Okay, click Kurt. Glass peg. Glass peg, that's one. What's another one? Slap egg. Slap egg. <laughs> <laughs> what's, it, what's the other one? 
Behold, what manner of men are these that wear their legs in parentheses? Gaflix, <laughs> okay, very good. So we got all three of them. If you remember any one of those, you can remember the seven sins, the seven deadly sins, gluttony, anger, pride, lust, envy, greed, and sloth. And you can find every one of the seven deadly sins in the ten times that Israel rebelled against God. And it's interesting to see that gluttony happens to show up multiple times in there. That's a, a sin that's still very prevalent in the church. Let me give you a quick review of the, what we covered in test number three before we started that subsection on faith versus fear. You remember test number three has two parts. Part number one was manna. Part number two was quails. The part number one about manna is Exodus 16, 11 through 15. And uh, they were griping, we want something to eat. And um, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread. You shall know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So they couldn't go out and pick up big pieces of pita. It wasn't an easy job. I mean, you think about frost on the ground and it's round and the the moisture hides it so you've seen I think probably you've seen dew on the grass right and you see what that looks like early in the morning well when that melts then suddenly there's something little teeny weeny there they say what in the world is that God says go out pick up some of it make it into bread try it out it's good <laughs> David tells us in the Psalms that manna is angel's food. He gave them angel's food to eat. But they had to work at that. They went and picked up these little teeny weeny things. Not picking up big pieces of pita like this and putting them into a basket. Little tiny things and to fill up a basket. And when the dew is gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. That's tiny. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, Manna. <laughs> it is manna. What's this? <laughs> That's what it means. What's this? For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Go pick it up. Then the manna and the hoarding. Verse 25. Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye? This is how God views it. I can't emphasize verse 28 enough. How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? They say, hey, you know, that didn't sound like a commandment to us. That didn't sound like, when, was the, when did the legislature gather together and in session they passed this law that says, do not go out on Saturday to pick up little round things off the ground. I don't remember them ever discussing that at Congress. I mean, did the Senate vote on it? No. God said it's a commandment. It's a law. When I tell you, God says, when I tell you to do something, it is a law. When I tell you to do something, it's not a suggestion. It is a commandment. How, how lightly we take the commandments of God. How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath... Jesus told us the Sabbath was given for man. God said, I'm giving you a break. I could have made you work seven days a week, but I didn't make you work seven days a week. I gave you a break. I give you one day of rest. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. You don't even have to do it to feed your face. And a lot of people say, man, I just got to work on Sunday. I got to work seven days a week because if I don't work seven days a week, I won't have enough to live on. Listen, can you trust God to meet your needs? 
I think so. I think so. And God said, this is his command, Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Context being to try to hunt for manna. Now, we've noted this before, but hoarding, not wise planning, but hoarding is a common sin among Christians because hoarding is a visible manifestation of the sin of Greed, covetousness, yeah, heard them both. That's the same thing, covetousness and greed. It's a visible sign of covetousness and greed. And God killed Israelites in the wilderness for covetousness. Do you not get the point? Covetous proves that you're not worshiping him as God alone. We saw that there are at least three key principles. I hope you remember these. I covered this, gonna go over it real quickly now. So list them if you haven't written them before. There are at least three key principles that we learned about the sin of covetousness in this text. Number one, covetousness means you don't really believe that God can meet all your needs. Covetousness means you don't really believe that God can meet all your needs. You're going to have to do it yourself. Number two, hoarding, which is the outward manifestation of covetousness, hoarding means that you have a false god. That's blunt. Hoarding means that you have a false god. Why? Principle number three. Covetousness is an inward sin that reveals you are expecting a different god to meet your needs rather than the god of heaven. In the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray? Give us this day our bread for the next 1,722 weeks and three days and 47 minutes and 22 seconds. <laughs> Is that what you pray? Give us this day our daily. Did God provide for Israel on a daily basis? Is that how Jesus taught the disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Recorded both in Luke and in Matthew. So you got it twice. Is that what Jesus taught? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Is that what the Apostle Paul taught when he said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus? Did Paul teach it? God is going to meet your needs? Do you have to worry about God meeting your needs? No. As you've heard me say many times, God meets our needs, not our greeds. Because greed, covetousness, hoarding, is a sign that we have to trust ourselves that we're really, in that case, worshiping a false god. You say, well, but how can you tie covetousness in with worshiping a false god? Oh, well, because Paul says so twice. He says it in the book of Colossians. He says it is in, in the book of Ephesians. Paul states clearly that covetousness is idolatry and that covetous people are idolaters. People, is idolatry worshiping a false god? Yes or no? Yes. Listen to what Paul says. When Christ, this is Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, that means kill, put to death, smash it down, kill it, kill it, kill it. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And he begins to list them. Now, some of these are pretty bad. Fornication. Ooh, that's bad. Uncleanness. That's really, really nasty, bad stuff. Inordinate affection. Ooh, loving stuff that you ought not to love. Evil concupiscence. Mm, that's evil desires. Concupiscence means desires. Look at the last one. Out of those five, it's in this category. And covetousness, which is idolatry. That's how God views covetousness. He says, you've got a different God than me. You're not worshiping me. You're worshiping an idol. You set stuff up in the place where I should be. You've pushed me over here to the side. I'm one of the minor gods over here. And you took the main pedestal and you put your stuff up on top of the main pedestal. Covetousness. 
Covetousness is idolatry. Yes or no? Is idolatry worshiping a false god? Yes or no? Yes. Come on, I want to hear from everybody. Yes. Yes. Who says no? Anybody? Who remains silent? <laughs> you get the point. Look at the next verse. Covetousness, which is idolatry, then. For which thing's sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Do you want the wrath of God? People, do you understand why God nailed them flat dead in the wilderness? I mean, it's amazing the mercy and grace of God that we're not all dead here in this room. Because Paul tells the Colossians, he says, you know, you guys used to be that way. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. We, we expect that from pagans. We expect that from unsaved people. We expect that from the world. But we shouldn't expect it from Christians. Listen to what he says over in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and following. And here it has that same list. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. You know, let it only be about 49% of your life, but not 50%. Is that what he says? Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Not once. It's not to control just 40... 9% of your life and 51%, you know, takes, I mean, you still got the balance there. You, you outweigh it a little bit. Verse 4, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Verse 5, he comes back to it. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, that relates to self-gratification. Now get number three. Nor covetous man. Now he didn't have to describe whoremonger. He didn't have to describe unclean person. But listen to what he says about nor covetous man. Who is an idolater? Are you covetous? Only you can answer that question in your heart. God already has the answer. You can fake it. God knows. And God is the one who holds you accountable for it. Nor covetous man who is, not might be, who is, present tense, right now, point in time, actual fact, not hypothetical, who is an idolater. People, what would you say if you came in here on Sunday morning and right back here I had a big platform and I have the Queen of Heaven standing up here, Virgin Mary, and she's got all these crowns and stars around her head and she's got the serpent under her foot, you know, crushing down the serpent. And I say, isn't it wonderful what we've just added here to our worship setting? Doesn't it make you feel more worshipful? you would throw me out in a split second. What if I put a big, big fat Buddha up here? What if I put a big statue of the Hindu goddess Kali? You know, she's the goddess of murder. And she has like, I think, eight arms, like an octopus. And every time she's depicted, you know, she has blood dripping out of her mouth and she's holding the skulls of severed heads of people and dead bodies at her feet. What if I stuck that up here? God looks in your heart, and you know what? He may see an idol just like that. Covetous man who is, that's point in time, matter of fact, right now, is an idolater. And God is sitting over here somewhere on the side. You've shoved him over there in the corner. And you've got one of these other horrendous statues sitting there in the center of your life, and you're focused on it. Hoarding is 
the visible manifestation of covetousness. Who is an idolater? Or who is an idolater? Be very careful. I had covered that before. But now we're done with number three. <laughs> the fourth rebellion after the wilderness of sin was at Rephidim. Fourth rebellion. Wilderness of sin. And that's, <laughs> when we see S-I-N, we think of doing bad things. Well, they did bad things there, but it's zin is actually the Hebrew there. It doesn't have to do with our concept of sin, but uh, the wilderness of Zin was at Rephidim. I introduced that point of rebellion just before we started faith versus fear. Rephidim was where Moses struck the rock that produced the water. That's Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7, and Exodus chapter 19, verse 2. It was also at Rephidim that Israel fought the Amalekites while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won a great victory over Amalek, and that's also in Exodus 17, that's verses 8 through 16, which we had read at some time. So, at Rephidim, we find a replay of test number two. Who remembers test number two? I asked you about test number one. Somebody got it right. What was test number two? Walking by faith for water, remember? Learning to learn to walk by faith for water. And we saw that there was a replay of four things. You're going to find some themes that repeat over and over as we move through them. The four things that repeat here, number one, Israel questioned the motives of Moses. They're always questioning the motives of Moses. Did you know that's true in almost every church, except the ones that are dead and out in the cemetery outside the church buildings? <laughs> they question the motives of leadership. Number two, Israel accused Moses of murderous intent. You brought us here to kill us. Number three, Israel questioned the motives of God. And number four, Israel accused God of murder for ten. So two questions of motives, two, question, or two accusations of intent. Exodus 17, 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Zin after their journeys, journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now, we've heard something about water before, haven't we? The same test that we saw before the first test was, it was bad water. Remember, we read that this morning when I read the passage. We don't like the water. It's bitter water. This water, we don't like this water. We can't drink this water. Come on, Moses, give us good water. First test was bad water. Now we have no water. You didn't like the bad water? So what if I give you no water? Huh? Now it's no water. God is asking them a question. Did you learn your lesson the last time we had a water test. You've all seen little water test things. You know, you can get them down here at Home Depot. You can test your water to see if it's got, you know, what's that stuff called? Radon in it and all that. Um, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and they said, Give us water that we may drink. <laughs> you know, you can bellyache at the leader all day long, but who's in control? Who is in control? God. Okay, God is in control. And that's how Moses responded. Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Now listen, here's, this, here's the principle. Oh, this is so important. Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Remember, rebellion against ordained, God's ordained leadership is rebellion against the Lord himself. It's rebellion against God. Moses says it to them. Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children? Oh, think about the poor kiddies. And our cattle and with thirst. You know, I had a bunch of environmentalists here already. Um, all the green people who worried about, more about their dogs and cats than they did about the... Anyway. Same accusations, same rationale. We griped before, maybe it'll work again. I mentioned that. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. 
Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now stop and think for a minute. Moses has a visible symbol. Have the people ever seen the rod of Moses before? Where did they first see the rod of Moses? No, before the Red Sea. And the plagues of Egypt. They saw the rod of Moses. Do you remember when Moses took his rod and he cast it down in front of Pharaoh and it became what? A snake. And the Egyptians cast theirs down, their magicians, and what did Moses' rod do? It ate up theirs. Moses held his rod out over the land of Egypt and flies came and lice came and all the ten plagues of Egypt came. They've seen the rod of God. Now they're great. Did they see the rod of God when Moses held it out and it divided the Red Sea? Yeah. Did they see when Moses held it out and the Red Sea closed? Was there a lot of water in the Red Sea? What are we dealing with here? Water. <laughs> Do you get the point? God is saying, are you people so stupid? Are you people so thick-headed that you don't understand that I control all the water in the universe? You tempt the Lord. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou brought us out of Egypt to kill us our children and our cattle with thirst? Listen, if God had wanted to kill them with water, or with absence of water, he could have done it at the bottom of the Red Sea. He could have said, Okay, Moses, you keep on going. I'll block them in, and I'm going to get rid of this whole mess all at once. Remember, the Red Sea is 118 miles wide at the point where they went across. We studied that in detail. He could have gotten them all all six million of them in the middle of that there would have been plenty of room and God could have said now I'm going to shove the Egyptians back because I'm really tired already of my people we're going to wipe them out and he closed them and that's the end of it and God could have said to Moses as he did say on one occasion Moses pled for the people he could have said you know now Moses I'm going to take you and I'm going to make a great nation out of you teach your kids to do a better job than those guys did teach them to learn to obey me you know what we all have opportunities to learn to obey God. And most of us don't learn. Why? Human nature. Old sin nature. When you walk in fear instead of walking in faith. When you walk in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. When you walk according to the law instead of walking according to grace. You find all those contrast in the book of Galatians and Moses cried unto the Lord saying what shall I do unto this people they'd be almost ready to stone me now could God have kept the people from stoning Moses yes were they putting a lot of pressure on him to make him say that to God yes and the Lord said unto Moses go on before the people take with thee the elders of Israel and the rod with which you smote the river take it in thine hand and go Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. All of the elders become accountable at that point. If they ever again rebel, God will smite them. We're going to see what he does to the elders later on. God will smite them because they have been up close witnesses. They weren't standing at the back of the crowd and saying, wonder how he pulled off that magic trick. They weren't like the, the millionth Jews standing somewhere in the middle of the congregation out there, you know, trying to peek around and see what's going on up here. They were standing with Moses when he did it. There shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted Moses. And Moses was upset about it. He had hurt feelings, saying, 
Lord, why are they calling me names? Is that what it says in the text? I hope you're following along. Exodus 17, verse 7. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I mean, <laughs> you almost feel that you... Is the Lord among us or not? Come on. Where is the Lord? Come on, tell me, please. Is he among us or not? If God brought them that far, would he drop them? Dear people, if God has brought you, brought you this far, will he abandon you? Jesus promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. These tests are given to Israel for our exhortation and edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's what the New Testament says. We haven't gotten that far yet, but that's the bottom line. This is not just interesting stories in the Old Testament. This was designed to teach you who God is and what his people are supposed to do in response to him. When he gives a command, what are they supposed to do? Obey. When he gives a prohibition, what are they supposed to do? Not do it. When he gives them strength and comfort, what are they supposed to do? Trust him. Is the Lord among us? All they had to do was look around and look behind them and they'd see a closed Red Sea and they'd see dead bodies of Egyptians up on the shore and they'd realize God who smote Egypt, he's with us. They see the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. Is he with them? And how many times do we question, Lord, you don't really care about me? If you cared about me, you'd do this and this and this. No, God does what's best, not what you want. And he does it for his glory and for your good to help you to learn to walk by faith. Amen. Gracious Father, thank you again for your word and for its power and for the privilege of studying it. Oh, Father, I pray that your word will bring us all under strong conviction of our sins that we might repent, that we might live, that we might walk by faith, that we might be filled with your joy. Jesus first, others second, ourselves last, and in so doing, overcome the seven deadly sins. Father, thank you once again for the privilege we've had of being in your presence under the teaching of your word, under the tutelage of our Lord Jesus Christ who is our God and whom we worship. In Jesus' name, amen.